What does Maddie think that George Karloftis is better than Derek Thomas at? Stay tuned. Everything? And find out what on this week's episode of 21 Questions. You are listening to KC Sports Network, the number one podcast network for today's Kansas City sports fans. With former players from your favorite teams, informed perspectives, and former insiders, this is the place for you. You can find us wherever you listen to podcasts or on our YouTube channel, all over social media, or our morning newsletter, KCSN Daily, dedicated to your Kansas City Chiefs. KC Sports Network is proudly presented by Emprise Bank, your partner in possible. What's up, everybody, and welcome to 21 Questions brought to you by our good pals at McAdoodles. We love McAdoodles. They have their Osage Beach location that we will be visiting and recording from very soon, and they have a store opening in Lee's Summit very, very soon as well. If you are in either one of those locations or in any of the locations next to a McAdoodles, get over there now. Like, it, it's the happiest place on Earth. Screw Disney World. McAdoodles is the happiest place on earth. And I am very happy. I'm the second happiest place on earth right now because I get to do this with my good pal, Maddie Lane. Maddie, my friend, how you doing right now? Sing, 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 no. No. sing, no. sing. <laughs> so from the, from the big institution's biggest uh, fan, how much longer are you going to deny us a musical opening to 21 questions, Craig? forever and ever my friend i i am sorry but the singing has ended my I, i'm retiring the singing i i have no more singing to give to you people i'm tapped let's get tapped out we respect your decision because you are in fact great um oh, no. I'm, i am happy to be back here on 21 questions and I, I, I enjoy doing 21 questions with you craig because we we get we have you know we do this pretty good we're not too serious about this it's fun it flows all over the place and it's going to go for 63 minutes so everybody <laughs> sit back enjoy hopefully you're on a long road trip hopefully you're at home relax you know in your underwear or whatever you wear around the house and let's get this started all right. Um, for those of you who don't know, this is a question and answer show. It is mostly football questions now that football has arrived and the offseason is passed. These questions are cold from the KCSN Discord channel. If you are a paid subscriber to KCSN Daily, that is the sub stack that we have all of our writing on, you have access to this Discord and you have a chance if you go to the content channel there is a question posted there. The closest person to get that question right based on some things that happened this weekend has a chance to win two tickets to the Chiefs preseason game coming up here. So get there if you are a subscriber and you're not already in the Discord. Get in there. Get signed up. Do all that stuff so that you can potentially win a ticket. These questions come from there. You can ask us questions there. This one comes from G Money. Next round of questions, he says, with Frank Clark's new bod slimming down, according to Chris Jones, approximately 35 pounds. We'll get into that, Matty. He's likely going to fall below the Spags DE criteria on weight. Do we think that that changes anything? And would the staff slash Steve Spagnolo like him to beef back up at all? Now, before you take off on this, Matty, do we really think that Frank Clark has dropped a full 35 pounds? If he did, I wouldn't know what he got up to, right? Because yeah. two years ago, we talked about, uh, well, one, we saw that Frank Clark's weight at one point in time was, you know, like the 220s or whatever it yeah. was um, on the uh, on the arrest report. So mm -hmm. we know he played too light two years ago. Last year, when he returned from injury, I think he looked big and not only in a good way. He looked bigger. So like, you wanted to tell me that last year he played a little bit heavier than you would have preferred and definitely heavier than he's been with the Chiefs. I would buy it. I would buy that Frank Clark of last year played in the 250s, maybe even eking up to the 260s because he didn't look like he was missed, maybe in the best shape he's ever been. But 35 pounds off of even if I'm being generous here, 260, that's real, real lean. Like that's back down to being too lean that everybody, including him and the Chiefs kind of acknowledged maybe wasn't the best spot for him. So I, I don't know if I'm believing that. And then looking at him, he does not look like the frail Frank Clark that we saw two years ago. So 
if he lost 35 pounds, if that's true, I want to know how heavy he got because mm-hmm. he looks in like he's in phenomenal shape. He does not look small in any way, shape, or form. So, you know, I, I don't know if I believe the number, and if so, he must have been crushing some steak in Hennessy leading up to this 35 <laughs> pounds to a weight loss. <laughs> I, I mean, to answer the second half of this, because I'm with Maddie there. Now, if you wanted to tell me you lost like 20, sure. Yeah, like I, I'm, I'm on board with that. I, I can get on board with that. Just 35 seems like a lot because, I mean, man would have had to be like 275 to where you, you're like, oh, okay, dropping 30 pounds. That, that's a good thing. And even that is pretty low. So to hit the second part of this, yeah, he falls below Steve Spagnuolo's criteria on weight. Um, I think he still plays with power he plays the way that spagnola wants so that's not necessarily an issue but it is one of those things to kind of monitor a little bit we we've seen guys especially under andy reed that have fluctuated in weight a little bit chris jones is a guy who's fluctuated in weight um it it remains to be seen what that's going to do for him on the field if he starts getting bullied a little bit um i he steve spagnola is not gonna be happy about it i just not like because Big Frank sets an edge. Like that's one of the things that he does really well is play the run well, set the edge well, be able to stack an offensive tackle. If he doesn't have the sand in his pants to do that anymore, and I believe he does. I mean, he still looks strong as hell, but if he is so light that he's going to get moved around, I, Steve's like, no, and you know, uh, uh, Cohen aren't going to be happy about that. Like they want a guy that could set the edge, play strong. So I think we'll find out pretty soon i mean watch watch how much he plays on early downs we'll see here all right um b higgs 55 is it true that when the rest of the league was looking to draft the next debo samuel the chiefs went to the second round drafted the next cooper cup sky Moore just looks really good as all i'm not real i'm not willing to anoint cooper cup on him by any means yet that's 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 who that's a that's a big expectation there but you know i I've seen a lot of Debo. I've seen a lot of Cooper Cup. I've seen a lot of people trying to find the comparison for Sky Moore here. I mean, Manny, what what would you say is your kind of comparison for Sky Moore now that you've seen him on the field in training camp a little bit? You've seen some of the explosion at the NFL level. I don't know if you even had one during the draft process or maybe if it's changed since then. I don't know if I have one off the top of my head. Um, I don't. Okay, so Cooper Cup specifically, I don't think I see. I think that he's a little bit more sudden and explosive with his movement, not the same type of good route runner, but not the same kind of route runner that I think that Cooper Cup was. He's also not quite as big as Cooper Cup, specifically as tall. Uh, Comp-wise, I don't know if one's jumping out to me. I think I want to really see what he looks like once he gets out there on the field. I know the popular one that just about everybody had for him coming out was Golden Tate. Mm-hmm. I think that he, I think, I think that he's a little bit more explosive of a mover. I think he's a little bit thicker. This one's a little, you had to ride with me for this one a little bit. I'm going to ride with you. He's not quite the same level of athlete, but he's close enough that I think this comparison still makes sense. He reminds me a little bit of a still mentally there Percy Harvin. Percy Harvin, right. before he goes off the deep, and I don't think he's quite the same elite, elite freak of nature that Percy Harvin was, but that's the way he moves. It kind of reminds me of it's not always herky jerky. He's not necessarily jittering around. It's foot in the ground, explode forward, explode laterally, get north and south. And I think that's kind of how Percy Harvin moved when he was at Florida and when he first got into the leagues. Like that's where I'd lean to right now. But I think we got to see him once the real game starts to really start to draw any comparisons. No, I, I'd agree with that as well. I was just kind of going to mock draftable to see if there's any names that jump out here. And one of the first names that jumps out, Stefan Diggs. Um, I don't know that I like the, uh, you know, a similar athletic profile and all of that is what it is, but I, I don't know that I love that comparison. I, you know, that's one of yeah, those Yeah, I think that- Diggs is a little bit more of like a freelance kind of, he's putting a lot of flash into a lot of what he does. And I don't think yes. Sky Moore does. I think Sky Moore is very much, I, I don't want to say robotic, but robotic ish. And it's going to be, it's the, the head in. fake and shoulder fake here, mm-hmm. exploding the other direction. That's your cut. Whereas Stefan Diggs is going to get to the top of his route. He's going to dance. It's going to be very fluid. There's going to be a lot of extra stuff to it. Like I just, I don't think they move the same. But I mean, hey, if he wants to become Stefan Diggs, let's do it. I mean, yeah, like I, I'm, I'm cool with that as well. And you know, then I, 
But for whatever reason, Brandon Cooks came to mind, but Brandon Cooks is not explosive, but very agile. So, like, that, that's one of those, and Sky Moore's kind of the opposite there. Not that he's not agile, but, like, not to the level that Cooks Yeah. Has. So, I don't know. It's just an interesting thing to see here as this has evolved. Kind of what, how it's going here. So, um, let's see here. Scrolling down on some of these... With defensive game plans, this is Adam Harney. With defensive game plans being fairly vanilla in the preseason, what are you looking for to evaluate the new receiving core? Maddie. Um, I touched on this specifically with Sky Moore earlier this week on the lap. When he's out there and it's not against the first team guys, which he will play plenty, not against first team you know, starters of the Bears, does he look different? Does he just look like he moves better? And if the earlier he comes out of the game, the better. Like the earlier he leaves the game, the better the Chiefs feel about him. So like that's good. But does he move a little bit better than the guys he's going out there against? And then I think the next thing you got to look at for starting at anybody, not contested catches, not even necessarily if they're creating separation, but just like what's it when you can see them, what does it look like? When a guy's getting off the line of scrimmage, does it look like he has a plan or is he coming off the line of scrimmage? kind of freezing in the moment, squaring up a defender and starting to throw a bunch of moves on him like it's a one-on-one -on -one at camp where there's no time. like you, There's no urgency to get through a route in a one-on-one. -on -one. Is that how he's approaching every rep? Because if that's the case, then that's the game's moving a little too fast for him. The guy needs to catch up. So you want to see a guy get into rhythm, get into the offense quickly. Whether he has production or not, I don't think matters as much. You just want to see somebody that comes out there and understands the difference between one-on-ones in training camp and then when you actually get onto the field and how a real route's got to go with progressions and reads and everything yeah that, that, that's that's exactly what it is it's playing within the team playing within the scheme you don't want to see you know sky more overlapping juju on a route or something like that you don't want to see him in the same space and it's probably not going to happen with those guys but it might happen with some of the guys a little further down on the depth chart you, you want to see him get to the spots that they're supposed to get on time you want to see that be part of the quarterback's field of vision at the time when he's hitting the top of his draft, you know, you know, drops and everything like that. And then after that, I want to see how precise they are in and out of breaks. I mean, that's one of the things that we've nitpicked on with several receivers over the past several years. And, you know, I want to see that grow. You know, I want to see McCole Hartman. The stuff that we've seen in training camp looks more precise. I want to see if that continues to be more precise. I want to see if he gets some of those looks, if he looks as sharp against the defense here not against guys that are playing maybe a cover two playing a flat zone i know there's, <laughs> it's so funny to read some of these you know comments after some of these big catches and stuff like where's the cornerback where's the safety and all that and their their defense is working on some coverage stuff too guys but i mean like i want to see what he looks like against the defense is actually trying to lock him up a little more trying to purposefully take away what he's doing rather than maybe just trying to go through the motions, trying to get some organization on the field. And, you know, he kind of looks like blown coverage, but they might be working on something different. So it, it could be fun there. All right. Joel Penfield, our guy from over at Royals Farm Report. What is a realistic expectation for Isaiah Pacheco's production this year? This is a really tough one. Um, I, as I said earlier this week, I think Isaiah Pacheco is going to start getting some more run towards the end of the year. I don't know that we'll see a ton of it at the beginning of the year here, but I think he's certainly going to get more run at the end of the year. I I, I could see Isaiah Pacheco maybe being a 450 to 500 scrimmage yard guy um, as being maybe running back three in this scheme. That's really good. Um, that, that would exceed what a lot of the Chiefs running back three production has been over the past couple of years. So I think that's good. And that builds, I, again, you know, if we see that arrow really pointing up at the end of the season, he's getting more reps and that's when the volume is coming. That's when those yardage are cut, that yardage is coming. Then you're looking at, okay, 2023 is the year that we're going to see Pacheco take that step into the starting role. But I think it's going to be hard for him to get on the field early. I think he's going to be hard for him to get integrated early. I am more than willing to get my words eaten by, by that man. I, I, I love his attitude and his approach to the game. So I hope that I'm very wrong about that, but I'd say 450, 500 yards. Yeah, I think I guess the big part is like, where do you think is a realistic time for him to kind of take over the lion's share uh, of production, right? Like, so if we were looking at this team right now, like what, 
Where would you say Isaiah Pacheco starts to cross the 50% section of getting snaps or touches for the Chiefs? Or does that even happen this year? Oh, man. I'm not sure that that happens this year. I think he's going to be primarily third down back. I, I really do think that he's going to be primarily third down back. Right, Because, like, Clyde, in his rookie year, played, I think, 59% of the snaps for the Chiefs of the running back. I mean, and he played early back position. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And he played early downs. He played 59%. So he played well over 50%. I mean, we're looking at 800 rushing yards, 300 receiving yards. Like, he goes oh, yeah. over 1,000. So that looks good, but like we're still talking about a guy that very clearly was the team's starting running back until he got hurt in that year. I don't think Pacheco gets there at all, right? So if that's the case, and then you remove a lot of the rushing yards from being, like you said, a primarily a third down back, you're removing the guaranteed touches. Now you're putting him into a pass a route in which he's competing with Kelsey, Juju, MVS, McColl, Sky, where you're competing with a lot more guys, even if you're on the field for touches there. So yeah, I mean, like, I think if you see anything over 300 total yards this year, I think that's a huge win. I mean, like just him getting on the field and a significant, you know, point is a win here. Anything over 300 yards, I think you feel pretty good about. I would probably air around there three, 400 yards. I think would be a good solid season for him, and I'd feel really good about that going forward. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Andy Nagel, what three players are going to be hardest to see get cut? but who should be cut. Matthew, do you have somebody that's going to pain you to watch them get cut from this team? I don't know that I can come up with three guys that I'm going to be that broken up about. I could, yeah. but three realistic guys that I'm going to be that broken up about. Okay, so I don't know if I'll necessarily be s- sad, but I would be very, very surprised if DiCaprio Boodle, I talked about it earlier this week, <laughs> is not on this roster. I think he's all but a lock. So if he somehow doesn't make this roster, I will be floored. Sad's a strong word because I don't know if he's, I don't know if I would be anticipating him playing a huge role for the Chiefs like this season or even in the future. It just doesn't seem like there's going to be a spot for him, but I would be surprised to see him go ahead and get the ax going into this year. Um, And then I guess another one that would make me a little sad would be Mike Rose. And I don't anticipate him making it just Mike Rose fan. I think that he can do a little bit of what things the Chiefs need. They need a coverage backer. He's really good in zone. That's what he excelled at at Iowa State. So like if he does get cut, which I think right now is more likely than not, that would be a little disappointing because I think he might be good enough at exactly what he does and another team would snag him up before he hits the practice squad. Yeah, I don't know that I have another guy that I'd really be that okay. No, I'm, I'll say it. Um, Colin Saunders. I I like the guy. I think I think he's funny. I think he's fun. I when the Chiefs drafted him, I said that everybody's gonna love him because they're gonna love press conferences, they're gonna love the way that he is. We got to talk to him at the senior bowl. He's a really good dude, a really good guy. And and I will just be said from a personal perspective, just to be like, oh man, that kind of stinks because that guy's good. No, not that other guys aren't, but we, we got to talk to Colin a little bit. We got to you know kind of see that. And I don't know that he might be on the outside looking in. I hope not, but we'll, we'll see here. All right. Matt K has been asking this for several weeks. Um, and it's in all caps. And a bunch of emotes afterwards from people. He, asked me, he says, tell me your thoughts on the James Webb telescope. Well, Matt. Tune in next week to no, I'm, <laughs> I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> you heard it here first. 21 questions is gone next week. It's just an hour of Craig telling you all of his thoughts oh, on the James Webb telescope. I might be able to. I love it. And I, lo- why I love he thinks that it's, it's fake. Oh I love that. <laughs> I love that it's seeing further out into the known universe, giving us clarity, giving us better pictures of everything. It is awesome to see the entire space and scientific community just nerding out about the fact that is that a new galaxy is that a new galaxy like it's creating imposter galaxies and people are arguing back and forth over that whether or not the age of that galaxy is correct and everything like that it's just it, it's kind of rekindled things it's the, the same way not that i was you know super alive and present for when the hubble space telescope was first being unleashed into the world i don't i don't want to claim to be that old but like when it came out i know that there was a lot of hubbub about that there was a lot of stuff that was coming because you were finally getting to see pictures and stuff like that this is that next evolution this is that next awesome thing and the the stuff that we're getting from it is absolutely incredible getting able being able to see that knowing more about the 
infinitesimally large, you know, the universe that we're in. I'm just now I'm just rambling about a space. So telescope, now but. you you know Galileo really well. What do you think he would have thought about the James Webb Telescope? He would have he would have screamed and tried to light it on fire because he would have thought it was some sort of witchcraft. <laughs> So, <laughs> um, okay, I can do another question about you. Telescope semi adjacent. When you see these pictures and you see how big everything is, space, whatever mm -hmm. you want to call it, when you see how big everything is, are you somebody that is comforted by how big everything is and the fact mm. that generally speaking, we are relatively insignificant in the, the grand scheme of things? Or are you someone that feels scared by that and you're like, holy cow, there's so much going on? well beyond my minuscule existence in whatever all of this is no it's the first one uh first okay. of all I'm, I'm comforted by the fact that it's massive like it, yeah. it's huge it's it's nice i it, everything i do is incredibly insignificant uh, I, I i love that because at times it feels overwhelming not kcsn but other things in life feel overwhelming and it's nice to just kind of be like you know what this doesn't really matter all that much. Look at all that out there. It's, it's Being cool. the last hope for mankind must be tough for you. Um, oh, here's a question from Wes for you. How much wood could a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? Appro approximately three cubic liters. Andy Nagel asks, Star Trade Cut, Rojo Gordon Gore, Maddie. Um, I none of these guys have trade value, so I don't know who we're <laughs> trading. Rojo might uh, have trade value. No, he doesn't. He Look at the contract he just signed. There is zero trade value. I think that Carlos Hyde got traded, didn't he? So, uh, yes, I guess did. we're trading Ronald Jones. Um, we are cutting Josh Gordon because I don't know what he can do, and I guess we're starting Derek Gore because running backs don't matter. When Gore played, he was fine. Like he wasn't he was bad. Fine. It's like out of all these guys to start, like I know Gore will be fine yeah. in that running back rotation. So. Yeah, I know what we're doing. Just kind of makes you look at Andy Reid's running backs again. And you're just like, why, why, why invest? You know, <laughs> you get a seventh round rookie and Isaiah Pacheco. That looks good. You got good value out of Derek Gore, Damian Williams, Daryl Williams, Brian Westbrook, Jamal Charles. Westbrook. These guys are all on the roster right now. According to Andy. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Isaac Hughes, what football player from a classic football movie would you add to this roster? to ensure that we win the Super Bowl? This is a wonderful question. Um, I think I'm taking, I don't remember his character's name off the top of my head. I just lost it. I just had it. It's Lawrence Taylor's uh, character from Any Given Sunday. The Alvin pass rusher. Mack? Alvin Mack? Is it Alvin is that Mack? Right? Am I thinking thing? of the program? I think you're thinking I of the I could program. be mixing up my stuff here. Yeah. But it's Lawrence Taylor's because I would get LT, at least in some Thank form of his real. career, that he still looked good and could rush the passer. <laughs> that's, yeah. No, I think that's a good choice. Um, Bobby Boucher from The Waterboy. <laughs> According to Zach in the Discord, we already have him in George Karloftis. <laughs> no. Uh, no, I mean... That's one. Um, you know, I also um also speaking of the program, um Latimer, Steve, Steve, wh oh, whoever yeah. Latimer was, yeah. a lot of drugs, but very good, a lot of steroids, but very, very good at football. You know, the Chiefs are going for football character. You can have a wild card out there. I can only True. imagine the the kind of damage, literal damage that he could do to some opponents. So, you know, he's <laughs> he's another option. I think we both seem to be looking for at the defensive line position. If we were mm -hmm. doing this, that seems to be the angle we were both taking. And it's the funny. problem is like when you look at when you look at football movies, you don't have wide receivers be stars of them. They're always it's always a quarterback. And like, yeah, there's some good receivers throughout football movies, but like they're not stars. There's nobody out there I'm like, oh yeah, that guy was unstoppable as a wide receiver in X, Y, and Z movie. Heinz Ward ran away from a field that was caving in on itself in what was that? Which Batman movie was that? Dark Knight. Yeah. Just saying. I'm just saying. Dark Knight Rises. I, that, that is a classic football movie. Classic football movie. Wes asks, which Patrick Mahomes play would you show to a person that's never seen a football game to showcase oh. that Mahomes is the best in the world? It's a San Francisco play, right? The 49ers Ooh. play where he's pivoting Wasp? around in the pocket and just running and scrambling. Oh, yeah, no. it, it, That's it for Not me. Wasp. 
Okay. Um, Baltimore Ravens, first year as a starter, mm. overtime, mm-hmm. scrambling, throwing across his body, well out in front of where I believe with Tyree Kill, if I'm not mistaken, it was, was going. Mm-hmm. Very well placed pass that a lot of people say was ju- wasn't good. No, it was perfectly placed what he's Perfect. trying to do. Um, the issue is you have to understand football, I think, a little bit to understand the greatness of that play. Like that's the one holdup sure. is I think you have to understand a little bit about football to understand how great it was. But like I think if you even get the basics, that play right there is enough to show you a little bit of everything. Which is why Wasp doesn't count because the, the gravity of the situation for Wasp matters. And so yeah. I mean it's clearly I mean, I've got it on the wall right behind me over here. It's clearly one of the greatest if not the greatest play Ooh. in chiefs history so like but i got another it, one yeah the uh the run uh down the sideline against the titans in the playoffs Ooh, yes that's that's, that's not that's bad well like i don't know that's the first one you show but like if you want to say any non-pass or like you want to put together a small clip to just say this is the, the guy that's mm-hmm. a pretty good one to show yeah that guy he, is the guy if I get to show multiple, that's making it along with yeah. the along with the arm like that. That's going to be part of it, and <laughs> the left-handed pass, being able to switch and toss that one out there. That's that's up there. So I mean, like yeah. I'm, I'm, it's definitely in contention there. Man, it's nice to have so many to choose from for having. Oh, there's so isn't many. It great yeah. to have Patrick Levon Mahomes on your team. It's great. Oh, good. Speaking of left-handed Imagine. passes, Z Ewert eighty five asks. Who throws more TDs this year, Mahomes with his left hand or Travis Kelsey? Travis Kelsey. Easy. <laughs> you don't think Mahomes is going to throw a left-handed touchdown pass? No, Line he is. Back? No, oh. he is. <laughs> Travis is just throwing two. Okay, got it. Mm, under three. Three. Ooh, interesting. What's Does things, Patrick throw two? Andy's, Andy's never going to let Kelsey throw another pass ever again because it was picked off. And if you want to look Man. at like – Passes Cannon. thrown by non quarterbacks, and that was pr- that's a pretty good throw. There's a nice spiral. He looked good stepping into it. Mm-hmm. It, 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 was, mm-hmm. it went far. It just was picked I up. Mean, that that thing was the longest pass that we had seen from that team in a long time. At the time that he threw it, a long time. I very it? distinctly it? remember being a part of communities <laughs> that we all went. All right, so like, yeah, it was a bad pass by Travis, bad decision by Travis, but like, he should throw the ball more, right? <laughs> I mean, it, there were they did QB competitions after camp, and there was more than once where I do believe that Travis Kelsey beat the Chiefs uh, quarterback room on a couple of those. <laughs> so yeah. All right, Fish asks, would you rather Leo Chanel and Trent McDuffie be Pro Bowlers this year, or? Isaiah Pacheco and Sky Moore, the tandem, Maddie. What do you think? Chanel and McDuffie. I think Mm -hmm. if those two would be pro bowlers, I think it is going, it would mean more because I have enough more faith in Juju Smith-Schuster, McCole Hardman, MVS to be adequate and the running back room to be adequate than the rest of the corners or the rest of the linebacker room. Uh, And then I also throw in this caveat. This is a bit of a Maddie answer. I don't know. This is probably in bad faith, but um. There's a chance that Isaiah Pacheco and Sky Moore could make the Pro Bowl as special teamers, right? Like yes. that's fully in contention. So, like, mm-hmm. I don't care about a Pro Bowl for returner. returner and punt returner. Can you imagine if Dave Tobe with those two guys turns them into Dave Tobe, who deserves all the credit in the world, Maddie? Every ounce of credit for them making the. <laughs> I'm doing this on purpose just to get under Maddie's skin here. But can you imagine? We still guys. hear about McColl being a pro bowler because of punt returns. We which do. Wasn't even deserved. He wasn't even a good returner. He wasn't even, he's not a good returner. Dave like, Toe, baby. Whatever you want about him. He's not a good, but his stats weren't even good. His Dave stats, Toe. his results, nothing about it was good. He just was a returner for Dave Toe, but had two big returns down the stretch. So everybody mm-hmm. voted for him. That's true. That's true. Jay the fan asks if there was a movie being made about your life, which Chiefs player would play you in the movie? Answer for each other. I mean, if if oh. if it's Maddie, I gotta answer for him. Man, Whew, this is a tough one. I might have to go with George Karloftis on this one because that man puts in the work and Maddie puts in the work. If if you're part of the Discord, we have a gains channel. Maddie is a frequent poster in it. You get to see Maddie. Lifting often, along with several other the KCSN crew, but 
Don't go I, with the Maddie puts in the work. George puts in the work. I don't think that there's a big leap there. He'd have to grow a beard. Um, I, I think he should grow a beard. <laughs> So for Craig, um, I kind of just got to find Crumb, the tallest, moving on. <laughs> the tallest guy out there, right? I just looked for the tallest Chiefs player. Ugh. That was one route, but instead I decided Craig is great. Patrick Levon Mahomes is great. The best quarterback, the best man. I, I think mm -mm. Patrick Levon Mahomes is the only person that could shoulder the burden of playing Craig in a movie. And even then, the role might be too big for him. I see. I thought you were going to say Jody Fortson, and Jody Fortson's been hurt a lot. And man, I'm old, and my knees don't don't hold up anymore. Harrison so Bucker was my close. Harrison Bucker is my close too. Uh, He's six four. Did you know that? He's tall. I did not know that. Still shorter than you, but tall. It's true. Barely, but it's true. Not as handsome either. I don't know about that. Harrison Bucker is a handsome man. <laughs> All right, Wes asks this one's for you. Which farm animal is your favorite, Maddie? Ooh. Ooh, Mine is Tank, of... your pig uh, <laughs> Tank, of your pig. farm animals. He has taken to sitting, too. He learned that when Meatloaf sits, he gets snacks. So Tank now sits anytime you walk near him, thinking he's going to get a cookie. Um, so, yes, sitting pigs. They're, uh, the, the pigs are kind of destructive sometimes when they're out, though. So, like, not lately, but sometimes they can be destructive, not on purpose. So, eh, you know, they can't be first. Um, the One of the goats, Goat Mahomes. I, I like Goat Mahomes. One, because his name is Goat Mahomes. <laughs> but the goats are fun. They're kind of cool. And he's the smallest of the bunch, but he's very clearly in charge. The much larger male knows that when Goat Mahomes wants to come eat or wants something, he's kind of move out of the way or he's going to take a couple headbutts to the neck. So uh, Goat Mahomes and the goats don't do anything. They kind of chill on their own and they're fun <laughs> to watch. So yeah, he he's the leader in the clubhouse right now. What's up, Doc? Asks, do you see any of the undrafted free agents making the 53-man roster? I don't. Mm. This is this is one of those years that I don't. And I think that part of that's because the Chiefs did a really good job of insulating the back end of their roster with their day three picks this year. You know, they haven't had a lot of them in the previous years. So you've seen more spots open up. If I had to pick, I mean, Mike, Maddie already mentioned Mike Rose. He's a guy that might make it. Jerry on Ely maybe he's at least gotten some run he's gotten some special teams play we haven't heard a ton from him he's at least got some athletic prowess you know i i can see ways that andy would look at him and go that guy's kind of fun i i would like to have him on my roster but man i just don't see a whole lot of opportunities for undrafted guys to make this roster this year maddie do you see anybody not real I mean, <sighs> Mike Caliendo's gotten yeah. a weird amount of reps with not the like third, four stringers. So like you want to say it, the like third or fourth, like the third reserve interior offensive lineman, maybe he sneaks in there because they want a body. I would love for Ely to make this roster. I think he'd be a mm -hmm. fun addition. I don't think this is the year. I think the wide receiver room has got to be weeded out a little bit. I think the running back room has to be weeded out a little bit before he really has a chance. I'm not saying that he deserves it over any of those guys. Just there's a lot of bodies contending that probably should be ahead of him a little bit. So Caliendo, Ely are the guys that I have my eyes on. Mike Rose, maybe, but like I think he's got to show a lot of improvement between now and when it's time to make the final cuts. Yeah, I agree with that, and unfortunately, and I like all those guys. That's the, that's the sad part. They're, those are all fun guys. We are going to take a small break. We will come back with more of your questions right after this. And we're back. Thank you all for joining us for 21 Questions, where the KCSN subscribers get to ask us questions about football, life, whatever the case may be. If you are enjoying this, or even if you're not enjoying this, hit that like button, hit the subscribe button, share it with your friends, go on Apple, go on Spotify, you know, go give us five stars. Tell us, tell us what your favorite part of today's show was, whether or not you had a favorite part, go give us five stars and tell us about it. So we'll do that. Let's get back on the question here. Will Yoder says, what do you think is the most likely to be the weakness? If you had to choose one of this defense this year, is it going to be, you know, against the run pass turnover sacks, third down goal line tackling? What What's your general thought on what the weakness will be of the defense this year, Maddie? Pass rush. I think it's going to be the pass rush. I think that they will struggle at times, not all the time, but at times to get a consistent pass rush. There will be plenty of times where we're going to be asking young corners to cover longer than they should. And 
this is the issue the Chiefs have had for the past couple of years. The pass rush doesn't seem to work great as a unit or as a team. And maybe that fixed a little bit with Joe Cole in here, but there will be reps or games where Chris Jones seems to be really on, but he gets no help. There will be a couple of games where Frank Clark seems to be having a really good game and it doesn't seem like Chris Jones is having his best effort and just so on and so forth. So maybe that changes this year, but the defensive line, the pass rush especially, just seems to be a little scattershot. And if that continues, it's just it's hard to present a good pass rush, a good defensive line if the guys aren't unified and working off of each other very well. Yeah, you know, I, I did uh, at the day that we were recording this, I did uh, radio with Jason Anderson on 810 this morning. We were talking a lot about the pass rush, and he brought up the fact that, you know, the chief sacks have gone down every single year and they were terrible last year in sack percentage. I believe they were 31st is what he said, according to the metrics that he was using. And conversely, they were fifth in pressure rate, which was their highest of, of the, of the season that lines up, you know, if you're getting pressure, but the quarterback's escaping out the back, I mean, that's, that's wasted pressure. <laughs> you know, you want to have guys that can collapse, that can work together to bring this stuff down. If you get a free blitzer as a DB, you got to bring down the quarterback, a corral them, not allow them out of the pocket. We saw too many times last year where that was the case. So, yeah, I think that that's going to be it. Now, we're going to see some struggles with, with some of the rookies in the secondary. I think we're going to see some growth pains there. I think that's expected, but I bet by the end of the year, we're going to be praising what they're doing there. The pass rush, I'm with Maddie, could be the thing that really kind of falls off here. We'll ask another question here. Curious the thoughts regarding George Karloftis' pressure or presser talking about 60% of most players' sacks coming from power and how speed rushes are a bit overrated. Now, he asked that of me. I am not equipped to answer this in the same way that Mr. Defensive End Matthew Lane over here is. Maddie. Do you have any takes on that power versus speed rushes? I, I mean, I, in my opinion, just to throw mine out there, I think you need both. And I think you got to balance it because you can't have tackles that are setting the same way against you. You got to have, you got to be a little bit more unpredictable. What are your thoughts about what he said there? The power is more important than speed. I think generally speaking that yes, probably over 50% of sacks come from non-speed moves probably i don't i don't know if i believe power because i think a lot of sacks come from effort and just not stopping and i guess you would classify a lot of those probably as power say. over <laughs> speed george karloff just definitely has that <laughs> yeah and so like i get it from that about five years ago four years ago i started to kind of undergo this mind shift that the nfl was maybe moving away from speed rushers because the ball's getting out too quick and you no longer need these speed rushers that can win up the arc because the ball is going to be out before they can even possibly get there. And you have the West coast offense, this quick passing offense is taking over what you've seen. You've gotten these better athletes. You've gotten better athletes to play quarterback. You've gotten everybody's going out of the, the out of gun anymore. Drops are deep. If you got, if you can win a speed rush and you can do it at seven yards consistently, you're right there at the quarterback often. It's like I've almost double backed now that if you are an elite speed rusher, I think I would take an elite speed rusher over an elite power rusher. I think it will okay. result in more consistent pressure in today's NFL. I don't think Karloftis is necessarily wrong in terms of power wins more consistently, disrupts more, but I do think that elite speed rushers actively matter a lot right now. And I would almost go out on a limb and say, if you split this up to third downs to raw passing situations, I bet those numbers tip greatly to speed rushers or speed rushes being the predominant leader in terms of sacks rather than power rushes. Dunklin Anglin. This is a, a multiple choice question here, Manny. Which is more likely, George Karloftis breaks the rookie sack record held by Derek Thomas, 10 sacks. Trent McDuffie breaks the, breaks the rookie PBU record set by Marcus Peters in 2015 with 26. Or Leo or Cook break the rookie tackle record, which is 98 by Kevin Ross. Just for reference, Nick Bolton last year. 70 solo tackles which is more likely of those three oh it's certainly not the tackle record that's not yeah, happening um, that's not happening. the if there was no justin reed and brian cook was starting every game next to juan thornhill okay mm -hmm. maybe maybe but no nah, that one's not happening 
I don't. I don't think McDuffie has the arm length to break up this? that many Dude, passes in a year. This defense is insane. <laughs> Marcus Peters got targeted a lot that year. He I did. don't know if McDuffie will get targeted that much. I don't think he risk is as risky as Marcus Peters was either. Like that just seems unlikely. So by default, it's Karloftis collecting ten point five power effort sacks. I guess. Matt and Maddie out here saying that George Karloftis is better than Derek Thomas. You heard it here first. No, I, I think that that's the one. I think the other two are just unattainable. Like, again, that's why I threw in the Nick Bolton thing, because Nick Bolton played a lot for a rookie linebacker and still only collected 70 solo tackles. And that's what this is. It's for solo tackles here. So that's it's really hard to collect 98 solo tackles as a guy that's only playing in the dime brian cook or only playing in the base leo chanel that's just going to be a very difficult thing to do there if nick bolton didn't get it last year i don't think either one of those guys are getting it just for reference i know 10 sacks doesn't seem like a lot i posted this poll on twitter the other day steve spagnolo has not had a player in kansas city that has had 10 sacks yet none zero in that time period, 22 other teams has have had at least one of them. Steve Spagnuolo has not had one. Oh, and by the way, it doesn't happen very often for rookies. Like, hardly ever that double-digit sacks occur. There will be, if George Karloftis does it this year, he will be number four since 2019. In the past four draft classes, he will be only the fourth rookie to do it. It's it's tough. It's a really tough hurdle. Unlikely, but the most likely. It, it, I don't disagree with that, <laughs> but still incredibly unlikely. Craig K. Gominger asked, Craig, Maddie, Kent, Tucker, BJ get to tailgate together. Who's in charge of food, <laughs> music, drinks, games, etc.? I mean, I'm in charge of... Man, I gotta be in charge of food. I do. I was going to take <laughs> drinks, but I don't, I don't trust any of the rest of you. So I got to be in charge of food. Um, <laughs> I'll let BJ bring the drinks. He's got that sweet holiday hookup. He could do that. He is, um, yeah, as long as he's not bringing us rum, we're good. Like, yeah, the drinks are real. The drinks are really pretty easy, right? Like, don't don't bring me like light beers. Like, I don't want nonsensical beers. Like, if you're gonna bring a beer, make sure it's like a like a, a very good only Craig selected craft beer. But like besides <laughs> that, you just bring like real liquor. We're good. Like, we can make that work. Um, you know, I want <laughs> I want Tucker in charge of music i think i, I do too uh, that's what i was gonna music. say and you in charge of games and kent in charge of games. nothing <laughs> <laughs> what what do we want I, kent's in charge of outfits okay fair i i will give him that he's even though he was outfits. upset that we were all dressed in the same blue hoodie in las I vegas know. i'll know. let him i'll let him go ahead and be in charge of outfits he's get one oh, more fits. chance kent's in charge of our fits the rest of us have important things to bring to the tailgate <laughs> That sounds about right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Zach Eisen asks, what's more likely McCall has a thousand receiving yards or Clyde has a thousand rushing yards? I honestly, that is a hell of a question. I'm going to say that Clyde's going to have a thousand rushing yards, but man, that's close. Like I don't, I, I think that McColl's going to get close to that thousand. I do. I, I think he's going to be a part of this offense, whether or not it's going to be the, the way that we all kind of hope that he takes the step, whatever the case may be. I think he's still going to get plenty of targets and I think he's going to get up close to that thousand, but I think Clyde's going to get every opportunity to be the guy on the ground. And I, I think that he's going to get all of these opportunities against lighter boxes behind the best offensive line that he's played again, you know, behind it, all of that nonsense. For me, I think it's Clyde. I think I would lean towards Clyde too. How many receivers do we think have a thousand yards? I think 26 receivers, just receivers went over a thousand yards last year, right? Mm -hmm. So if 26 receivers are going, let's just assume that's the same. I don't know if that's, you know, average per year. I really don't. I'm quickly checking. Oh, it seems way less actually the year before. Yeah, I was going to say, I thought the passing production was a little Ooh. bit down last year. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. I'm seeing that a lot less players did in 2020. Oh, never mind. Okay. Then 2019 looks like it was boosted back up to about 29 players. So like you're looking somewhere, but you know, somewhere in the 25 to 30 players is just average. 
do we think Cole Hardman is going to be one of the 30 most productive wide receivers in the NFL sharing his targets to Travis Kelsey, who's gone over a thousand yards. He's a pretty much a lock. Oh yeah. And he's then a lock. now Juju Smith Schuster, who I think probably has as good, if not better odds. And then MVS, who's still going to eat into that. And Sky Moore is going to get some run. And that's like, I think there's a lot to share a lot. from McCall Hardman to all of a sudden jump up an extra 300 yards on what he's already done. So I'm going to lean towards Clyde. He was close to being on pace as a rookie before he got hurt. It was within the realm of possibility. You assume mm-hmm. they run a little bit more. They run a little bit more gap stuff that he ran at LSU. He's a little bit more impactful, a little bit more effective with it. I would lean that way. Again, probably neither are likely, but I would lean towards Clyde. That's that's a good one, though, Zach. That's a really good one there. All right. Um, let's see here. Casey from KC. How much, if at all, do running snaps increase for the Chiefs this year? Man, I think if I'm pandering to the audience, a lot. It's going to increase a lot. Those light boxes against those two high structures. We're going to see a lot more runs. They had the opportunity to do it last year, and they had the opportunity to stick with it last year, and they didn't. And then they went out and they added a bunch of receivers. They added a bunch of mouths to feed. that, And I don't mean that in a bad way. Like a bunch of guys that they feel comfortable getting the ball to through the air. And you've got Patrick LeVon Mahomes. I don't know that it's really going to increase. I think it's going to be about the same. And I know that's going to disappoint some people. But I, me too. I would like to see them make defensive coordinators uncomfortable by sticking to the run game. Even if it's like a game or two. If they're just like, yeah, we know you're playing too high. Guess what? Clyde's going to get the ball over and over and over and over again. And you're just going to have to live at, you know, with us giving you paper cuts all game long until you have to shift out of it. You know, if Andy wants to put that on tape midway through the year or even early in the year, I am happy with it. Make defensive coordinators have to look at that and go, man, I'm, I'm a little bit worried about that. I don't want to have to game plan for the run game with Patrick Mahomes back there, but I kind of feel like I have to. That being said, I don't, I don't, I just don't. He could have done it in the past and, and, and he's chosen not to. Since Patrick Mahomes has taken over as the Chiefs quarterback, the Chiefs rushing or like run percentages have been 38%, 38%, 37%, 37%, 37%. Yeah. Doesn't seem particularly likely. Now, if you jump back to when Alex Smith was the quarterback, it was up over 40%. So your argument for them running, running the ball more is, hey, Look at what defenses are doing. Look at where the offense has maybe struggled a little bit and where we are leaving yards on the field. Let's go run it more like we have had success in the past. If you want to make the argument against them running the ball more, Patrick LeVon Mahomes. So, you know, take your poison. I personally think they should run it more because 75% of the RPO should be turned into just run plays. Yeah. Just run the ball <laughs> on 75% of your RPOs that the NFL has figured out. Just run the ball. Even if it's 50% of them, that's fine. You're still going to get 50 to 75 more runs just by doing that this year. If they literally just make that change and don't run anything, no other changes besides making half of their RPOs run plays, I think this offense looks significantly better. I think it's a very simple change they can make. Will they? Mm, probably not. All right. Lee Eit on Y45. No, I'm just kidding. It's it's late in Y. There was a big conversation. Or is about it Leighton? <laughs> no, Leighton. No, the conversation about how we were pronouncing his name. So I wanted to mispronounce it as, as badly as possible. Do you enjoy watching the preseason? I personally feel stressed that someone could get hurt. Yes, I do. Uh, for the second and third stringers. Uh, you know, when we do this draft stuff, like we, we, like a lot of guys that end up bottom of the roster guys on a lot of teams. It's not just the chiefs that I enjoy watching the preseason because some of these guys won't get to play at the NFL level. And as you're watching some of these collegiate guys and you're like, man, I really like that guy's skill set or that specific thing. I'd like to see him on a team. I'd like to see him in a fit because I feel like that that could be something that he could translate and get better at and do stuff like that. DiCaprio Boodle was one of my guys. I loved, loved what we got to see the versatility stuff that he could do from the slot and as a safety and then he ends up on the chiefs and i'm watching him in the preseason and that was fun it was really fun to get to sit and watch so i like it for those kind of bottom of the roster guys 
I could care less whether or not the chief starters play. I'm fine with just sitting them. I, I realistically am, but I do enjoy watching some of the bottom of the roster guys play. Love it. Um, I don't <laughs> care to watch most like preseason football. Like I won't tune into a lot of games after the first quarter. I might poke around, like have it on while I do something else and check for names that I recognize from past drafts because I love the draft. But when it comes to the Chiefs, no, nah, I will watch it all. I will watch it all the way through. I don't necessarily care who wins or loses, but I'm equally invested as how guys playing in the fourth quarter look is how guys are playing in the first quarter. Um, yeah. It's just, that's the way it is. So like, I can't, I, I'm glad they shortened the preseason, but I also can't get enough of actually watching real football. I, today's a rough day. I hate that Andy Reid will never, ever joint scrimmage. The fact that like never <laughs> in ever in his existence, will he have a scrimmage versus another team that you could possibly get to go see he just upsets me. And that's even like five steps down from a preseason game. So that's listen, Andy really can't be having people out here on the field, hearing the way that the team is conversing, I guess. Can't because, converse their vanilla cover too. Listen, <laughs> they're, they're doing some cougar reps. Um, <laughs> Nick Deal asks if you were Veach and were looking to make a Mike Hughes esque trade to bolster a position at the roster cut down deadline, what position would you be looking to strengthen the depth of? Um, this was tough because there's a lot of positions that I'm actually pretty comfortable with. Like, <laughs> if they added a corner, like, I'd, I'd be a little put off by it, depending on the corner. Like, I'd be Did like, they already hey. do that with Lonnie Johnson? Just not right, right now? Yeah, like, that's exactly. That's already Mike move, right? Right. It kind of is. So, like, there's not a whole lot of positions that I look at, and I'm like, yeah, maybe. If you wanted to tell me that they added a guy at the bottom of the receiver room that, that they liked, fine. Like, I'm not in love with the bottom of the receiver room, but we're talking – wide receiver six like you know, not, yeah not a guy that's like a huge impact guy there i don't know that we're gonna see a mike hughes ask move um okay for me if there was a running back out there i guess that was a first round type talent that has struggled to land over you know his first three years in the league but he was still a first round top talent they have two I on the roster you, i Damn, one's, one's not going to be there. Uh, and just like, like, that's the one position that like, cause I'm with you. I look around, I'm like, I don't know. I kind of like, I like the swings they have at most positions at the back of the depth chart. So like when there was this other issue earlier on, when this team was a little bit thinner, you had multiple positions. You're like, where's the young talent coming up through there? I can look and see some at receiver, maybe not an offensive tackle. So like, maybe that's another one. Maybe you find an offensive tackle around the league that hasn't, you know, worked out, but been a little bit of a bust and was a top 75 type pick. And you bring him in for nothing to see if you can turn it around. So like, maybe that would be the other option, but outside of tackle and running back, they have young guys waiting. So like, I don't know if I really want to bring somebody into that. Would you add a linebacker to the bottom of the linebacker group? No, because they have. Would they have, you they add have Roquan line. Smith to this linebacker? No, because we they yeah. have Nick Bolton. We already have exactly. a guy that can't cover and <laughs> just goes and collects tackles. Like I don't mean that as necessarily a bad thing. Like I do for Roquan, no, but not for no, Bolton. But that, if is, that matters. Yeah, that is what Roquan is. Like I, I would rather not. I just saw some the, his name floating around the Chiefs fans being a little bit like, well, maybe. And it's like no, no. They already got young guys. Like, I would say this, if this is the realm you're looking at, from, if Willie Gay is not going to play covered snaps, if Willie Gay is not going to get any chance to get in the dime and they're just going to use him as like this offhand blitzer or just like basic go chase out to the flat, even out of the nickel, okay, fine. You can bring in Rokon Smith. If that's all you're going to ask Willie Gay to do, why not have Rokon Smith do those things? Because those are what he can do. And then he's probably a better linebacker right now at everything else than Willie Gay is. That we'll said, say this. Willie playing Willie the hook. Gay. Willie playing the hook right now. Hook, yes. No, good. hook good. When they just mm -hmm. push him out there in the flat to do nothing, though. Yeah. That's yeah. that's my whole if that's all they're gonna do, then you might as well have Roquan do it because he's mm -hmm. a better, you know, running down linebacker. He's a probably a quicker processor of the game right now. Now, I'm not like that's not an option to trade Willie for Roquan no. Smith. It's just this is me saying, hey, go put Willie Gay in the dime because he's the only linebacker on this team <laughs> that can cover anything. <laughs> Lee87 asks me, but Maddie, you're on here and you, you're the perfect other person to answer this uh -oh. because I think every, everything else is just kind of got to go over people's head. If we took over as defensive coordinator for Kansas City this year, first of all, we're awful. Second of all, <laughs> and implemented the cover seven defensive strategy that I talked about 
on the KCSN Daily. What current players would be your starters that you would try and implement in your defense? He said, and 15 to 20 total man team. I'm not going to get all the way into 15 to 20 total man team with that. But talking about starters for cover seven, I detailed Nick Saban's cover seven stuff. I will say this. If you are implementing the full gamut of what Nick Saban can do in cover seven, you need guys that can do literally everything. You do. They have to be able to play man at a high level because they're going to get isolated. So Trip McDuffie going to be fine with that. You have to be able to play zone at a high level because you are going to see a ton of zone snaps. You have to be able to play deep safety as a high level or cover the deep third of the field or deep half of the field as a cornerback or a safety. You have to be able to do literally everything. Cover seven exists in the NFL. Teams do it all the time. They typically don't base out of it like you know Nick Saban does at Alabama because it is so difficult when you're playing as a week-to-week the types of receivers that you're going to see, the athletic prowess that you're going to see out there, and what your matchup could be. It is very difficult to just overwhelmingly be better at all of these coverage styles than the opposition. Nick Saban gets to rely on a whole bunch of five-star recruits that are way better athletes and way better football players than most of what they are seeing. So he can implement all of this, and he can be good at all this because if somebody's just an okay deep half defender, guess what? They make up for it in so many other ways that you're fine doing that. That being said, I think what Spagnuolo is doing Maybe outside of Joshua Williams, who I feel like is going to be more of a press guy, that you're going to have to rely on press and flat coverage. I can see maybe you have to zone over him a little bit more. I think the group that they have, that they're running with right now, is the group. Uh, that's Legarius Need, Trent McDuffie, I think Juan Thornhill, Justin Reed on the back end. That allows you the most flexibility. Guys that can kick down in the slot to play man. Guys that can fill as quarter safeties from deep in the run game. And guys on the outside, again, maybe other than Joshua Williams. And again, we're projecting right now because we haven't seen a ton of Joshua Williams that can play that kind of deep zones, cover some of the stuff in the shallow and the flat and insert against the run and out and the wide. I think that's the group. If I had to pick a group with these guys that I would pick, I know that's a cop out, but I I think it fits with everything they'd be asked to do. Yeah. I mean, I, I think so because cover seven, fantastic coverage. It's a lot of fun. Teams don't necessarily base out of it all the time because it's a little specific in terms of where it's going to absolutely stifle a deep or an offense and what's going to work against it. So it's not going to be something you're going to run every single play. It's not cover seven. Isn't always going to be a base cover. It's going to be kind of hard. I think in the NFL to run that as a base coverage, especially on early downs. Right. And mm-hmm. so that part would be a little bit of an issue, but when you are going to it, yeah, I think all the players that Craig's mentioning here that we've seen the chief traditionally, trot out there right now seem to be the right guys that you would want for all this stuff it all makes sense if i wouldn't take a step further if we're talking about playing cover seven versus three by one um Mm -hmm. i guess josh williams is all consistently on the backside he's consistently my isolated corner i think um just because i want him to be able to press i want him to be able to use the sideline like that's where he's gonna be at his best he's the best option for that so we can flip around a little bit like that if we know it's a passing down I'm not opposed to getting Brian Cook in there as your will linebacker lined mm-hmm. up as a backer, getting them into the box. I like him better chasing some crossers, especially if you're looking to pick up the number three coming across. I kind of like that idea or take the running back if they're just quick out to that, that side. Mm-hmm. I like that idea of Cook over even a Willie. I mean, Willie Gay would be my mic if we're if I'm in control. We're getting sure. we're getting Willie Gay in there. We're putting Brian Cook next to him. We're gonna show a little bit of range here and cover everything. So like those. Those are the only, like, I think actual adjustments that I think I could add to it. But Steve Spagnuolo's defense is always going to be ready to play cover seven because he will play it. He will play similar oh, yeah. stuff to it. It's like they're already ready for it, how they are built. Absolutely. Yeah. Spagnuolo plays cover seven. He does. He just doesn't base out of it. He honestly, I, I can't say that Steve Spagnuolo bases out of anything. The, the game plan shifts from week to week. There, there are weeks that he's going to play a lot of cover two. There are weeks that he's going to play a lot of quarters. There are weeks that he's going to play a lot of cover three. Then there are some weeks that he's saying, screw it, we're cover zero blitz and jo- Jordan Love all game long. <laughs> and we're seeing how he deals with it, which not well. 
All right, let's finish it up. We're getting really close here. Mike Denny says, Craig, what's the most egregious Maddie answer you have ever heard? I don't, they all blend together at this point. They, they just kind of exist in real life to me now. People say Maddie answers that aren't Maddie and I just kind of click in. I'm like, oh, okay. So like, I don't know that I have an egregious one anymore. They're just part of my everyday life now. I've accepted that, them. That was a good Maddie answer. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the one earlier this week I on the laboratory was a pretty was a pretty egregious Maddie answer. Taking for the, the preview the preseason preview show, taking four all, quarterbacks. All like, of the what taking, one player, all of the cornerbacks. Yes. That was a pretty that was that, a pretty that, good that, one. That's that's the most egregious recent one, that's for sure. No, no, I'll tell you what the most egregious Maddie answer was me winning the game by just saying Travis Kelsey, fully knowing that that was the right answer. So, <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see here. Two more. Just DRK of these teams, Baltimore, Cincinnati, Buffalo, Miami, Kansas City, Chargers, Tennessee, and Indianapolis, which one or more missed the playoffs. I think that's a good Indy. group, honestly. Indy, I think Indy, I, Indy, Indy. You think they're going to regress with Matt Ryan? You don't think they're making the playoffs? I don't think they're that good. <laughs> I don't think Tennessee's that good. I think the Indy's winning the division. I think so. I just do. I, I think that Matt Ryan makes them better. I think the defense is fine. It's going to be fine. They still got Jonathan nah, Taylor. Nah, Tennessee's got Derrick Henry back now. Nah, give me Tennessee. I don't think they're good, but give me them over Indy. No, Tennessee, Indy. Ten Tennessee is fake good. Anti-Indy. I'll be anti-Indy <laughs> until they spend money ever. I think the rest of those teams, Baltimore, Cincinnati, Buffalo, Miami, Kansas City, Chargers. I think that's I think that all of those probably should make it. I think so. Cincy. Yeah. What do you how do you feel about Cincy and Miami? I think those are the other those I, are the two. I mean, no, I you know, I don't think Miami's a lock by any stretch I don't think of the imagination. They are either. I think there's a lot of stuff that they can go poorly. I I feel like everybody is just glossing over the fact that they lost their like entire coaching staff that was mm -hmm. actually pretty good coaches pretty good just because things didn't get along and we're just like oh this guy that we think is really cool that likes rap and talks real cool and dresses like we want to dress is like gonna be a good head coach just because and is he will I mean, he he was he was pretty fun in san francisco i mean let's be yeah, real here but like kyle was fun before him too yeah though. kyle was so fun like, too yeah i don't so know it's like you know just what is it? it's like i don't know i feel like there's a lot of extra faith in a miami coaching staff that like how sure. good are they gonna be we I don't mean, really know talent wise so, they got more talent than anybody else on that division i, I don't Cincy, i don't think yeah and then yeah. since he like they were a wild card team that needed like last second sure. things to break their way to even win the wild card round so like now they did that all the way up to the Super Bowl. So like their mm -hmm. range of outcomes is anywhere from barely sneaking into the playoffs like they did this past year. Or they didn't just sneak in, but like barely sneaking into the playoffs and then a one score wild card game or going to the Super Bowl, right? Like they have this huge window because that's the team that they were last year. And I don't see a reason they would be significantly different this year. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think it's Pittsburgh. I mean, he, Kenny Pickett is QB three there. Yikes. So yeah. I don't, no, that's I, his hand size. <laughs> all right last one from david borland here what are the chances that kansas city can retain nick allegretti to this roster he can play both guard and center has starting experience might be attracted to another team and so he says if we can't keep him i hope some of the internal interior offensive linemen play well in the preseason this is one that i could see like i know we talk about some trades and stuff like that sometimes nick allegretti is a guy that andy reed loves certainly but might be a guy that doesn't that has more value to another team than he does to the chiefs. If some of these younger guys on the interior play well, because Nick Allegretti, certainly I, I would say he's best seven. W would you agree with me there, Matty? Top seven offensive lineman. Yeah. I think he's, especially the versatility, I think yes. kind of locks the locks that in, right? Like I ta right. pure talent wise, I don't know. I go back and forth with it, but just the versatility, the ability that he can step in and probably play center tomorrow mm -hmm. or step in and play offensive guard tomorrow. Like that does matter. So like, I think he's pretty comfortably locked as their quote unquote seventh offensive lineman. That, that being said, they have Austin Ryder. If they needed a guy that has that sort of center interior offensive lineman versatility out there. So if a team 
came knocking and said, Hey, listen, we'll give you a fifth round draft pick for Nick Allegretti. I think, I think Andy's sitting there and going, listen, Nick, we love you. We appreciate you. Enjoy your time in Chicago, buddy. You know, like <laughs> just send him right. on his way. You know, it, you, you take that sort of trade in that scenario, knowing that you've got the insulation there. But I think right now he's, he's a 53 man lock unless they got a really good offer for him. Would you agree with that? Yeah, and this is like when we're looking at trade. No, no, no. When we're looking at trade offers, you have to figure out what's realistic, right? And anything realistic for what Nick Allegretti has done, which has been a depth offensive lineman through his mm-hmm. entire career, realistic offers. You're probably looking at like a seventh, maybe even a future right. seventh round pick, right? I it's got to be a player means, for player. It's got to be. A he would mean yeah. He would mean more to the Chiefs than that draft pick would be. So then you're looking for a player, but like, is anybody going to trade? a known rotational player for Nick Allegretti based on like the six games or whatever he played were his six games that he played two years ago. Really that good. I don't know. So like, I think a team would really have to like really, really be desperate. That would be the best option. They would have to come out with some kind of fantastic deal. I just don't think it's realistic. So like, I don't think that option is going to exist because he's better than Parker anger was when they traded him for Charvarius Ward. Oh, yes. Nick Allegretti's oh, not so yeah. bad that he's a throwaway player. That's mm-hmm. going to be cut. He's got a very clear defined role, but he's not good enough that any team's going to be like, Allegretti, let's go get him. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. All right. That's going to do it for 21 questions for this week. Ladies and gentlemen, we have Chiefs football this weekend. Sing, 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 sing. sing. No, I was just singing it back to you. Um, Maddie and I and Tucker are going to be bringing you the KCSN postgame show after the preseason game. We will be live very shortly after that. So come stay tuned. Subscribe to the KCSN YouTube channel. If you are watching this right now, make sure you stay tuned to that because we will be live immediately afterwards. We'll be breaking down everything we saw, enjoying ourselves from having watched football after this stretch of no football it's going to be glorious so join us then and we'll catch you later